there might be some ways to do things different, but don't, yeah, don't give yourself too much, too much, too much grief there, yeah. Okay. yeah. It works if it's great. Yeah. All right. Yes, this is this is on. Um, hello, guys. Uh, we'll get started. There might be a few more people that come in. Yeah, there was a wave. That was excellent. Hey, <laughs> hey. Welcome to. Well, you guys have been here all day. Welcome to DrupalCon. Um, this is especially nice for me because I used to live in Nashville, so it's like coming back home, um, seeing all the new cranes that are going up. How many people have been to Nashville before? How long ago? Was it a long? 15 years ago, yeah, yeah. So it was like probably like a one block by one block radius 15 years ago, and now it's like 100 times bigger. So yeah, it's kind of crazy. How many people are staying downtown? Good, okay, cool. That's, I'm actually really happy about that. Because um, obviously downtown's where you want to be. Hotel space is kind of hard, so I'm glad that you guys figured that out. We're like a lift ride away. Anyways, um, let's, let's kind of get rolling here. And actually, you know what? Total speaker foul. Give me, give me one second, because I have my remote and I was sitting up here forgetting to put on that in there. One second. Hopefully. Aha. Uh -huh. I'll pick up the microphone when I say something significant again. I like to move around. So this will make everyone's life a little bit more interesting if I can. With any luck. There we go. And there we go. Aha. Yes. Yes. OK. All right. Back to it. OK. So um, hello. My name is Ryan. As you know, I used to live in Nashville. I come from the symphony world, so like my Drupal skills are so-so. I, I know a lot about how Drupal works uh, because of all the symphony pieces in there. My day job is I'm a writer for campuniversity.com. How many people have heard of that? Oh, quite a few. That's awesome. So we're, like, we're in the symphony world primarily, so I say like the Drupalized me of the symphony world. Um, so apparently I'm not doing such a bad job at marketing because you guys have found us. That's great. I'm also a total symphony fanboy, evangelist for them. And much more importantly, I'm the husband of the much more talented and beautiful Leanna, who normally comes to DrupalCon because she actually works with me and she loves it here and she has more friends here than I do, but she is not here this time. Although if you want to tweet at her, you, you, you totally should. If you have your phone with you, that's her Twitter right there. If you want to tweet and just say hi from DrupalCon, that would be awesome. Because, two things, first, she designed the slides. They were horrible when I sent them to her, and she made them pretty. So it's, all, it's good for all of us. It's gonna be much more entertaining. The second thing is, the reason she's not here is because she's at home with that guy. So that's the real work. I get to come here and like talk to you guys and do fun stuff. She is being a mom this week, so she's hanging out with my son Beckett's. Um, I, this is where I get to show pictures, right? There's another picture, and, and that's really the, the one that sort of encompasses him. And actually, now he's a little older, and that's him enjoying the spring flowers. We actually came to Nashville last week for spring break, and so there's some flowers from Nashville we were smelling. And then I flew back, and then I flew back here. All right, anyways, and there, there's Leanna's Twitter handle. If you're still typing that down so you can harass her, that would be excellent. Okay, so you guys, Drupal crowd, you guys have a superpower, and that is that you know Drupal. That is no small feat. Uh, most people that don't know Drupal uh, would be like, whoa, I do not want to learn Drupal. That is a big thing. So there's a lot of knowledge in this room right now, and that is going to unlock us in a lot of ways to be able to do other really cool stuff. So. Um, Drupal 8, and, and I, I put this as an intermediate level, so hopefully you guys have some, some knowledge about you know, some of the, the Drupal 8 symphony-isms in there. I'm not going to introduce those. 
Um, Drupal 8 leverages a lot of the modern stuff, OOP, namespaces, uh, and a lot of pieces that come directly from Symfony. So the routing and controller layer, the service container, these are literal things that are, are run by the Symfony components, which means if you went into a Symfony project, they would look exactly the same. In fact, there's many places in a Drupal project where you could like copy and paste a file into a Symfony project and it would just work. Um, so yes, this is Symfony with a question mark because I want to clarify real quick what Symfony is and what Symfony is not. You may already know this, but what Symfony really is is a collection of small libraries. I did a talk last year about uh, some of the more interesting Symfony libraries. So each library solves one little problem and that's it. Okay, so there's like 45 of them or something like that. And you could, you could be in a flat PHP project or in a Joomla project or something, something that doesn't use any parts of Symfony and you could pull in one little piece and use it. That's Symfony, okay? Um, we call them the components. They're the little libraries. So there's also the Symfony framework which is when we take all of those components and we glue them together so that you have a coherent experience of building a web application uh, that uses all of those components. That's sort of like a, it's a project. So what's interesting is, boop, Drupal is also sort of a glue that ties all the Symfony components together. So what, what exactly is the difference between Drupal and Symfony? What, what, what's, where are the similarities? What, what are the differences? <laughs> other than horrible technical debt, which is being worked off actively, and we have our own technical debt, but yeah. Um, so in the goal, you know, one of the goals of this presentation is to be able to draw the parallels between Drupal and Symfony. So when you go into a Symfony project, you're like, oh yeah, 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 I, I've seen this exact thing in Drupal. I understand the concept. I'm able to bring it over. So Drupal, from my perspective, what it is, is it's a route and controller system. How many people have created a route and a controller in Drupal 8? Perfect, I was hoping most hands would go up. Yeah, because I'm not gonna explain routes and controllers. It's a route and controller system, AKA hook menu in Drupal 7, basically. And then it's a container full of services. Services are useful objects. So it's a container full of objects that are tools. And that's it. And those services, those are really what do everything. They, they're services for talking to the database, translating things, resolving aliases back into nodes, uh, uh, the, the theming layer, uh, the thing that processes render arrays, those are all services. So every single thing that really makes Drupal a CMS and adds all the CMS features are these service objects. And in a default Drupal install, I think there's like 700 of them floating around and they're, all, they're like little robots that are all doing different things to bring the whole experience together. So Symfony is actually the same thing. It's a route and controller system and it has that exact same container, except when you start a project, it's basically empty. So Symfony is a route and controller layer. That's it. So if that, imagine that's the only thing you can do in Drupal is like create a route and create a controller and then go have a sandwich. That, that's basically Symfony in the beginning. So yeah, another way to say it is imagine Drupal where you were able to uninstall every single module, including core modules. And there would be no, absolutely nothing left except for that route controller system. Um, that is Symfony. So Symfony, the nice thing with Symfony is, uh, again, the, the pitch here is when you have that project that doesn't need a CMS behind it, that Symfony is gonna be a really good fit because of all the things that you already know. So one of the nice things about Symfony when you have those projects is it's very small, it's lean and mean, it's fast, and there's not a lot of files to look at. So as far as like trying to figure out what the project does and doesn't, there's not, you're not looking at a giant project, you're looking at something very small. Um, and the key difference, and you're going to see it over and over and over again in this presentation, is that with Drupal, you have all these features out of the box. With Symfony, you have nothing. And then every time you need a feature, you're just going to install it. So again, imagine Drupal, we had no modules. And so whenever you needed something, you're like, oh, let's install this module. Let's install the node module. Let's install all these other modules. So you actually piece your system together as you need to. All right, so let's code. By the way, I do have the code for this down in the bottom. That's a bit.ly link, decon 18 symphony And I'll have another link on the end for, to the, to the, to, I'll have that link again at the end. But if you wanna like check my work as we're going along, that's how to do it. So the way that you start a project in Symfony 
is uh, composer create dash project. How many people have used that command in composer before? Okay, yeah, yeah, a decent number of people. It's a, it's a glorified uh, command that basically clones a repository. So symphony slash skeleton is li literally github.com slash symphony slash skeleton. It's just a GitHub uh, project. It just clones that down, moves into it, and runs composer install. So it's just a way to clone a project. So there's nothing super interesting going on with that command. Um, and of course, this is what it looks like. It downloads all the dependencies that are already in that project. Okay. The no 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 no. Actually, let me let me go. Let's go this way. The interesting thing and really weird thing about that Symphony skeleton is that this is what it looks like. That is a Symphony uh, brand new Symphony project. It is exactly one file in it and it's composer.json. Weird, right? Um, but you'll notice something else that's special. This is back from the composer install command. So yeah, download stuff, yay. But at the very end, you see it kind of gives you this like nice message about what to do next. So one of the key things that's in that composer.json file is a special uh, composer plugin called Symphony Flex. And Symphony Flex is, powers the, the Symphony 4 experience. It's a composer plugin that does, well, we'll talk about what it does later. But for right now, it at least gives this nice fancy message at the end. And it's going to do other important things later. Um, actually, I'll, t I'll tell you what one of, them are one of those things is now. Because here's the mysterious thing. We went from one file, and after we ran composer install, we suddenly had about 15 files. So that's actually a superpower of Symphony Flex. When you install a package with Composer, some of those packages have recipes. Think of them as like little installation scripts. And so as you install a library, if that library has a recipe, Flex will actually add, like install that recipe in your system, which does things like create directories, create configuration files. So the idea is that we start with nothing, and then as you install packages, the package is going to take care of like adding any configuration that's needed so that you can just use it immediately. So this is like, the, the, you know, the trick with making Symphony 4 start so small was that when you start with nothing, it's really annoying to add new stuff because you're like, oh, we'll just install that package and then configure this file and create this directory and do these other things that are needed to pull that into your project. So Flex just automates that process for you so you can just install stuff and it just works. So anyways, we do start, a re really, I, you know, there's one file, but in reality, you end up starting with 15 files. Um, fun fact, if you remove a package, it also undoes the recipe. So you could actually, you could actually one by one, Composer remove the packages in Composer.json, and it would undo those things until you got back to just a single lonely file and actually uninstall the recipes. Um, so at this point, we have 15 files, and that's counting random files like git ignore files. 15 files and no database because there's nothing in Symfony. Routing in controller layer. So we're going to start the, the built-in PHP web server just for simplicity. You can use Nginx or whatever. So we have a built-in web server running at localhost colon 8000. We can go to localhost colon 8000 and just to make people feel really nice, we have a cute little welcome page in development mode. But we, we but really, we have nothing. All right, so let's start building stuff. I want to create an API endpoint. That's a really common thing to, to do with uh, Symfony. You know, you have this little internal project. You need a couple API endpoints. Pfft, let's just use a, something simple for it. So there's a two-step process for building a page. And guess what? Since most hands went up when I asked if you had built a route and controller in uh, Drupal, it's copy and paste the same in Symfony. So we're actually going to create the controller first. That's the function that builds the page. And I'm sorry if that's a little bit difficult to read. Hold on one second, one second, one second. No, no, I was thinking about inverting the colors, but it'll make everything else look weird. Um, so we write a function that builds the page. I'm using a JSON function. That's a shortcut that comes with Symfony. Pretty obvious what that does. It's just going to JSON, you know, return that string or that array down there as JSON. So that's the function that builds the page. Um, look at the location for this. It's in the SRC controller directory. I'm going to show you guys where I'm modifying the files in a second. Um, yeah, I'll come back to that in a second. So anyways, we have this controller, it's song controller, and the method is API write song. Okay, I'm just making those names up. The second thing is we're gonna create the route, and we're doing this in a routes.yaml file. Almost exactly like you would do in a custom Drupal module. In fact, it's exactly the same, it's just a different file name that you're putting this into. 
Uh, and there's the path slash API slash songs, and the controller is just the class name app slash controller slash song controller colon colon API write song. And that's it. Um, these are the two files that we just modified. And looking at the directory structure, I want you to think of a Symphony project as basically a module. So like almost like pretending you're, you're zoomed into a custom module and we're doing everything inside of that. So in fact, you can see in a custom module, there's a source directory and that's where you put all of your PHP classes. It's the exact same inside of Symphony. There's a source module and that's where you put all your classes. Um, in Drupal 8, your, you know, your namespaces need to be Drupal slash the module name slash whatever else you have. In Symphony, it's just app. So you'll notice that like my namespace was app slash whatever directory I'm in. So a little shorter, but same basic idea. Um, and really there's, oh, and the other thing is the routes file, that's in a config directory. So in a Drupal module, that would be what, like the module name dot routing dot YAML. Inside of here, it's config slash routes dot YAML. So there's like, a, you know, just the file name's different, but the concepts are exactly the same. And that's basically it. We're only, there's a couple other directories, but we're gonna do everything in source or config. If it's a PHP class, it goes in source. If it's a config file, it goes in the config directory, and that's where we're gonna do pretty much all of our work. All right, oh yeah, so of course, I was so busy to explain things, I forgot to tell you about our awesome project, our country music song generator. So this is our first generated song here. I rode my truck through some mud, it's very inspiring. And we're gonna basically keep hacking on this idea. Oh, fun fact, I did not need to rebuild any cache. So that's a great reason to use Symphony. There's no rebuilding of cache, no cache rebuild, no drush stuff. You just, there's, there's no hidden things going on. I, I, I modified one file, I modified another file, I refreshed the page, it worked. All right, so our project is still very small. We have, a, we have the service container, we have the routing system, and we have about 50 services that support that system. But there's, like I've been saying, there's nothing else inside the project at all other than that. So there's no templating, no database, no logging, no Koopa Troopas. There's absolutely nothing. All right, so the mantra in Symphony 4 is if you need something, you just install it, okay? Oh, and uh, also Drupal modules, you know, you install contrib modules. In Symphony, they're called bundles. They basically serve the same purpose. Um, the main reason, the main thing that installing an external bundle gives you is it adds more services to your container, adds more tools. Uh, it's kind of the same thing with the Drupal module. When you install an outside Drupal module, Drupal modules can give you a lot of things. They can give you like new menu links and new forms and routes and things like that. But one of the other main things they give you is they oftentimes give you more services in your container, a new tool to use or and some new event listener that causes some magic to happen inside of Drupal. So that's a really good analogy there. Modules and bundles are really the same idea. All right, so the first feature that I want to install is annotation support. How many people know what annotations are? Okay, good, good, good. Most hands again. You'll see them in a second, so don't panic if your hand didn't go up. So I'm gonna run composer require annotations. Does that look weird to anybody? It's not namespaced. It's not namespaced. Yeah, wait, hold on a second. Shouldn't it be something slash annotations, like symphony slash annotations? Yes-ish. All right, so we'll send Koopa Troop over here. He's gonna run that command. So composer require annotations. That's the second superpower of Flex. The first superpower, and we're gonna see a couple examples of it, is that recipe system. You install a package, and it actually you know, configures some files and adds some directories for us. The second one is the alias system, which is um, basically a, a, a way for us to give shortcut commands. So here it says composer require annotations, and right under there though it says updating version 5.14 sensio slash framework dash extra dash bundle. That's actually the package that's being installed. There's just a little shortcut resolution system. And the idea is basically that we want there to be one, uh, we want there to be like an easy way. If you need a feature like a logger, you just say composer require logger. And, and whatever one is the one that Symphony thinks is the best one that's gonna work, then that's the one that's gonna install. If you want to install a different one, great, install a different one, but you can just say Composer require, require Logger and it works. Question? Sorry, you may have already said this, but I came in late, but um, what directory are you running Composer from? Ah, good, what directory am I running Composer from? Everything's happening at like the root of my project. And so I, so I said, think of my project like a custom module. Um, yeah, 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 and so, so in that custom module also, and when you have a custom module, your custom module can also have a composer.json file. Um, so it's the same thing here. Our application has a composer.json file, so we're running this from the absolute root of our application. 
Uh, so the alias system, so we have, there's a website, it's called symphony.sh, uh, and you can go there and actually they'll show you all the packages that exist in the Symphony sphere and it'll tell you the aliases. So you can see there's apparently one called API platform slash API pack, and below it's a little small, but you see it has an alias called API. We're actually going to install that package later. So it's kind of just a nice cute feature, but it's not that important. The second thing is the recipe system. And so after it installs the packages, on the bottom you can see it says like Symphony Operations to Recipes. And it says configuring some library and configuring another library. And that's it actually uh, taking care of uh, whatever the recipe needs to do for those packages. And we're going to see a couple examples of that. All right, so once now the, the reason I installed the annotations library is that in Symfony, instead of you doing YAML routes, you can choose to use annotations for routing. It's actually the way that we do it most of the time. So instead of there being two steps to create a page, there's actually just this one step. You just go to your controller, this is the existing controller, and you add annotations above your controller that say that the URL is slash API slash songs, and that's it. So you don't have to touch a YAML file anymore. Um, you're good to go. All right, so let's go up. We're, now we decide that we want to render a template. Well, we know there's no templating system, so we do compose a require twig. Now we know that that is a alias for something. We don't really care, something twig related. It's going to install twig for us, and it's probably going to configure a recipe. And in fact, yes, we can see there's one recipe being installed uh, below. Now here's the, the twig is a really, really good example of like how useful the recipes are. Because one of the things that the, um, the recipe did is it created a configuration file, config packages twig.yaml. And in there, it configured the twig package. And don't worry about the specifics too much, but like from space, what you can see is happening here is actually configuring twig in our project and telling the twig system that our templates are going to live in a templates directory at the root of our project. So this is a really cool thing because like somewhere, no matter, no matter what system you're working with, like a, like a templating system, someone has to decide where the templates live or where the translation files should live. And this is either going to be some, feature, some configuration that's like hard-coded deep in the heart of Symfony or deep in the heart of Drupal. Like there's some line that says, you know, translation files will live here. Templates will live here. It's, you know, if you dig deep enough in Drupal's core or Symfony's core, you can find that. Or the other alternative is you force the user to configure this. That has the advantage of like clarity, right? Like I don't have to wonder why my templates live in the templates directory because I created a configuration file and I specified where they live. The downside of that one is it sucks to install stuff because it means when I install something, then I need to go create a configuration file. You know, it's the whole um, configuration or uh, convention over configuration. Well, Symfony basically does the opposite. We do configuration over convention. We want things to be explicit in your project, easy to change. But fortunately, because of the recipes, it's not a pain in the butt to set up because the recipe is gonna do it for you. So every time I install a package, I look and see what the recipe did because the recipe is almost like a tutorial for how to use that, uh, that particular library. In this case, I can see that it created this, this uh, configuration file, and it also created the templates directory. So suddenly, I didn't have a templates directory before, but now I have a templates directory, and pretty easy for me to look in the project and figure out where I should put the templates. Um, so I'm gonna go back and create another uh, page. So I'm going back to my same controller function, my same controller class, create another public function in there. I'm using the annotation routing, so my at route slash another dash song. And this time there's a render shortcut. That's how you render templates in Symfony. This arrow render, and I have the file name there, um, which I'll show you on the next slide. And I'm passing in a variable. Or I'll actually show you right here. So I'm sorry that that purple is not the best to see. So I'm rendering a template called song slash another song dot html dot twig. Uh, and that's going to map to templates slash song slash another song dot html dot twig. And then I have some twig code. I'm not going to go into the specifics of the twig code there, but this is basically me just using that feature. So in this case, I touch the controller and I touch the, uh, the template in the templates directory. Um, and that, see that base dot html dot twig? That's, a, that's the default base layout file that you can customize and add styles and all that to. And that's, that was also installed when we installed the Twig recipe. So it basically said, okay, here's your starting base layout, and now you can customize it. So you didn't have to try to create that on your own. Oh, and then of course, 
it works. So we can go directly to localhost, call an 8,000 slash another song, no cache rebuilding, and our, you know, our message shows up. Cool, all right, so let's keep drawing concepts to each other. So Drupal console, I assume everybody has used Drupal console at this point. Yeah, okay, how many people have used Drupal console? Okay, good, yeah. I asked it in the, in the, in the wrong way, and I only saw a couple hands, I got, I got worried there. So uh, Drupal console is awesome. We have bin console. It's already installed. It's literally a direct, in the directory called bin. There's a file called console, so bin slash console. And it is just like Drupal console. It's full of debugging stuff. It's full of, well, later code generation stuff. So we can run bin console debug colon twig. This is kind of cool because it shows us all the custom functions and filters uh, that exist inside of twig. Because Twig has like a core set of functions and filters, but when you use it in Drupal or when you use it in Symfony, like more are added that are specific to Symfony or Drupal. So this is like just a running list of all the custom functions and filters. Um, debug router, that's a, uh, Drupal console is the same thing. It gives you a list of all the routes in the system and there's several other debug commands. So that same exact concept exists. It's used the same way and you get it out of the box. All right, so what about, like, let's talk about debugging, better debugging tools. So I assume that a lot of you guys use Devel, use Kint, something inside of there. So we have, well, it's a little bit different, but basically um, we have something similar to Devel, it gives you a lot of the same tools, and we can install it with just Compose Require Debug. And this is just gonna install a suite of debugging tools. Now, two important things, actually, I'm gonna fast forward here. As soon as you install this, so compose require debug, you refresh the page, and you have the web debug toolbar on the bottom. See that black thing along the bottom? That just, boom, shows up. Um, and that's, first of all, that's like the best thing ever. Uh, web, there's a web profiler module in Drupal 8. A lot of you probably already use it. If you haven't, look up the web profiler module in Drupal 8. It's a sub-module under Devel. It's that for Drupal 8. It's awesome. So this is like full of debugging information, uh, performance information, database queries, uh, all kinds of information right there at your fingertips. Uh, what I wanted to highlight was, this is back when we ran the composer command, composer required debug, is the, the package it actually installed on the second line there is called symphony slash debug dash pack. And that's a, not a super important concept, but it's a new concept inside of symphony. Um, and it's basically the idea that sometimes we want people to like be able to run one composer require command and install like eight different libraries. Because debug is not actually installing just one library, it's us basically saying, well, if you want debugging tools, you probably want these five libraries. Like this installs logging, it installs the web profiler, it installs a few other things. So it's a, it's a super simple composer trick. You just create a new repository that's empty with a composer.json file make it require those five libraries, and then from people's projects, they can just require that one library, and they get five different libraries in, in reality. We call them packs, so that's what's going on behind the scenes here. Um, fun fact, like the only tricky thing with packs are they're like you can't handle versioning. Like This is getting, giving you version 1.0, but since it's downloading five libraries, you might be downloading this one at this version, and this one at this version, this one at this version. And later, what if you want to kind of control the version of those specific things? Well, the only thing in your composer.json file is just, you know, symphony slash debug pack at version one. So there's another command that Flex gives you that, uh, into Composer. You can run composer unpack, and then say composer unpack debug. And what it does is it replaces that one line in your composer.json with the five independent libraries at their versions. So you, today you can just compose a required debug, but then later when you actually care and want to control the individual versions, you can basically have it explode your, the lines in composer.json, so then you can control the versions yourself. <clears throat> All right, cool. So I, said, I mentioned this earlier, you know, like, our containers started very small, and as we install more things, we're getting more services. So one of the services that we just got was the logger service. We did not have a logger at all before. It's part of the debug pack that we got the logger service. So in Drupal 8, the way that we fetch services, uh, the cheating way that we fetch services, is with Drupal colon colon git container, and then we can say git, and we can provide the machine name for the service and get that service object back. Or you can do it the proper way. You use dependency injection. I'm not going to go into that. You know, you touch a YAML file usually to do that. Um, but the point is, like, there's this container, and, and you kind of like fetch the service out of the container by the machine name of the service. 
Symphony doesn't do that anymore. What we have changed our tactic a little bit. We have the exact same container, but we get things out of it in a different way. And the way we do it is whenever we want a, a service, we just type hint an argument. This is actually normally done in construct functions of services, um, but we, it also works in controller functions. Uh, but normally this would be like the normal dependency injection where you have the public function construct. So you can just say logger interface logger and Symfony will just give you the logger and that's it. And you can just immediately call something on it. This is awesome because just it lets you code super fast. You just type hint what you want, it gives it to you. And guess what? Because you're type hinting it, you're writing good code and your IDE is giving you auto completion on logger interface or on the, yeah, on the logger object. Um, so how did I know logger interface was like the magic word? Because that's the thing, right? Like, did I just like sit down and, and cross my legs and think about that long enough? So you can't just in, know the, that, that that's the right thing. So we have a debug auto wiring command. And this is awesome because this is basically going to list all of your tools. So you run debug auto wiring and it just gives you a list of types that you can use to type in to, just to get stuff. So you can see our logger interface right there in the middle, like that's how we get the logger. Um, two above that, it's got a horrible name. Well, it's not that guy's fault, but it sort of is. It's a cache item pool interface. That's the type that you use to get Symfony's cache object, which is awesome. It's just got a terrible name. Yeah, that is your, no, that's not your fault. No, no, it's not your fault, no, no. I'm saying the, the guy who built the Symfony cache component is sitting in the back of the room. Um, but he didn't create that name. It actually came from PSR. You know, they make the, the fig that makes the PSR rules. If you know what I'm talking about, it's, it, it's cool. If you don't, it's not that big of a deal. But there is a central organization in PHP that creates, sometimes creates interfaces uh, that the rest of the community follows, and they're the ones that created that name. So uh, end rant, it's just kind of an awful name. Anyways, that's how you get the cache object. So this is all of our tools right here. You can type hint these, and we're just going to pass them to you. Uh, and you get really good errors if you, uh, if you type in something wrong, we kind of suggest something else. So it's all, it's all really, really easy to use. All right, so let's say we want to organize some code. So we're going to make our, take our song generation up a notch and, um, and actually start creating random country songs. But to do this, we need maybe like 50 lines of code, 50 lines of code, perfect code that generates the next perfect country music song, okay? So instead of throwing this code in our controller, which we could totally do, 50 lines of code in our controller, we decide we want to isolate this to uh, an external spot and so we can reuse it other places. This is the classic thing where you put it into a class and put a method in the class and, and kind of create your own service. So in Drupal, we do, this, we, we do this exact thing. You just can go into your source directory of your module, create a class, put a function inside of there, register it as a service in a YAML file, and then go into your controller or a block or wherever and fetch that service out of the container. In Symfony, we thought that was too much work. So we've, 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 we have the same idea, but we shortcutted it. So this is our new song generator. This has nothing to do with Symfony. We just decided to create a new class called song generator. I put it into my source directory. It could go anywhere. It has a public function. Yay, good, this is a nice looking class. To use this, so all, like again, there's nothing, I'm not skipping any steps here. Step one, create this file. Step two, to use this file, is to go into your controller, for example, and just type hint it. Just type hint song generator, and it's gonna automatically pass that to you. If your song generator had a construct function that had a logger interface type hint, then it would pass it the logger. And then, of course, it would still pass a song generator into your controller. So you just run around everywhere just using type hints, and then Symfony wires that up for you uh, so you don't have to go to a configuration file and do stuff. Yes, there are edge cases where you do need to go into a YAML file, but most of the time you can just, you can just, uh, you, most of the time you just stay in PHP code. You just code and everything else happens. And if there's any doubt, because there's, we don't know exactly what to pass you, then you get a clear error message, then you go to a YAML file and you just add a little hint for that one little situation. All right, so let's add a database because we don't have a database yet either. Composer required doctrine. So the Symfony doesn't have a database. You can use anything you want. The library that most people use is called doctrine. It's an independent library. So we're just gonna compose a required doctrine. It installs a bunch of stuff. It uh, configures a couple of recipes, which is great. And then it gives us another nice little uh, helpful message on the bottom. Now, one of the 
uh, interesting things about the database that's unique so far is databases need configuration. Nothing yet has needed us input from us. Uh, when we install the logger, it, it just has defaults. We can change those defaults, but it logs to some file, it's fine. But the database actually needs some information from us. So um, it actually tells us on the bottom exactly what to do. It says modify your database URL config in .env. So the .env file, which is at the root of our project, is basically equivalent to the settings.php file. Um, settings.php file, of course, most famously has your database configuration. Uh, the .env file has any configuration that you don't want to commit to your repository. And these actually become environment variables uh, that you reference later in your application, so it plays really good with Docker and stuff like that if you're into that. Um, but it's not important for this. The cool thing is, as we install libraries, sometimes the recipes for those libraries know that they need some configuration, so they actually add, they actually modify this .n file. So those lines you see there, those were actually added a second ago when we installed Doctrine. So all we need to do is just go in there and modify it. It's kind of handled adding that section for us. Uh, once we've kind of configured our database there, um, to, uh, to actually create the database in doc, uh, with Doctrine, there's just a command to do that. So bin console, Doctrine, database create, that creates your database behind the scenes. Um, and, oh, and because, because by the way, if you can see up there, the database name is actually at the end of the connection string. So that's where it's getting the database name from. Um, it creates a database, but it's totally empty for now. So we need to actually start creating some tables in our database, because what we want to do is actually store some, we're going to like start generating our country music songs and store them in a, some like country music uh, table so we can keep track of our, our brilliant ideas. So to help us do that, we're going to install another library called Composer Require Maker. And what this actually gives us is a bunch of new bin console commands. Uh, this is pr uh, similar to uh, what uh, Drupal console does, right? They have all the generate commands. Um, the word make is more hipster, so we used to call ours generate, but you know, we're trying to keep up with millennials, so we called ours make, and so we have all these make commands, and we're going to go through a couple of them. So Doctrine, like Drupal, has an idea of entities, and, and they're, they're, they're fairly different. Don't think like they're the same thing, but they actually, you know, they're, they're, it's, they're actually pretty good uh, parallels to each other. So every time we want a database table, we're gonna have a single entity class. So you'll create a class and this will map to a database table. It's a classic ORM setup. So uh, you can actually create these entity classes by hand. They just look like, look like normal PHP classes, but we also have a make colon entity command, which makes it super easy to add stuff to your database. So in this case, it just starts asking us interactively what we want the class to be called. So we're gonna call it country song. And then it starts asking us to add fields. So we added a title field. It's a string type, which is a kind of a doctrine type that maps to a varchar in MySQL. Uh, title, um, field length, uh, can this field be nullable in the database? Cool. Uh, and then I kept going. I also added a created at field. It guessed that was a date time. And, uh, and then at the end, I hit enter again, and it's finished. The end result of this was that it created one file. It actually created two files, but one of them is not important right now. It created one file, which is this file. In our source directory, it created a new entity directory, and it's just called country song. It looks like a normal class with normal properties, the private ID, private title, and private created at. So it creates a property for every uh, field that we want in the database. And the way that Doctor knows how that field maps to the database is with annotations. Oh, annotations. So put annotations above the field, and it just figures out, uh, you know, helps it map that uh, you know, this field goes to, to this column in the database. Cool, so it's actually a pretty simple idea. The nice thing about that make entity command is it's not a one-time use command. So at this point, you're free to modify this however you want. You can copy and paste the title field and make another field. That's totally cool. But if you like the generator, you can go back and run it again and give it the same uh, class name, and it'll, you can actually add more fields to it. It also does relationships, so you can create another entity and then say that you want like a many-to-one relationship, start joining them together, many-to-many, many-to-one, one-to-one. It'll create the properties on both sides for you, all the adder methods so that like you, everything is kind of hooked together in a really nice way. Um, so kind of automates it, because one of the downsides of Doctrine is if you, write, if you wrote all of this by hand, it actually gets to be a little bit laborious. So if you use the generator, it, like, it just takes care of a lot of details for you. But the point is, either way, you just have a new PHP class. That's it. There's no database table yet. It not, has not touched the database at all yet. We just have this new class. 
Um, to create the database table, and this is super cool, we have a uh, command called uh, make migration. So database migration, right? The way this works, and it's just a doctrine superpower, uh, I wish I could take credit for it because it's cool, is it looks at all of your entity classes. So right now we have one, but let's pretend we have 10. Looks at all of your entity classes, looks at your database, runs a diff between the two, and then generates the, my, the MySQL code, or if you're using Postgres, the Postgres code, whatever, um, that you need to basically take your database to, uh, to modify it to match what your entities look like. So in this case, it's a simple create table, but if we later went and added a new field with an annotation above it to country music, you would see it would be an alter table to add that one new field. So this is awesome. You just like change your entities, run this command, and it generates a migration file for you. Uh, then to execute that, there's a command called Dr. Migrations Migrates, um, and it runs that. Uh, the way that works behind the scenes, because you guys are uh, smart crowds, so you're probably like wondering this, is um, it keeps, uh, has a uh, it has a database table and has a table in the database. That's redundant. It's a table in the database where it keeps track of all the migration files it's run. So when you run this command, it looks at that table and it looks at your migration files and executes any new ones. So you'll run this locally every time you do it. And then when you push to production, uh, that command's just part of your deployment uh, script so that it will run any uh, migrations that haven't been run on production yet. So it's super easy to like modify the database and keep things in sync. All right, so we have a database table, we have our entity. Um, so let's create a new API endpoint to save new country songs to the database. So we're actually going to kind of take over our existing API write song. One little change I made just to show it off is I added uh, on the route on top, I added methods equals post. Before it would match any HTTP method, but if you want to uh, only have this be a post or a git or a patch or whatever, you just add a methods equals and, and it works just fine. Um, if you can see it on the end there, Again, everything in Symfony, everything in Drupal, shared concept is done by a service. So if you want to save something to the database, the question is, what's the service that does that? The service is called the entity manager in Doctrine's case. So just like before with our song generator or with the logger, we just figure out the type hint to use to get that. And it's the entity manager interface. So if you ever need to save something to the database, you type in entity manager interface, it passes you that object and you're off to the races. Um, and here, I'm, what we're, to actually create the entity, I'm just saying song equals new country song. So I'm just creating the normal PHP object. There's nothing special about it. I'm setting the title uh, using the song generator to do that. And then the way you save things in Doctrine looks a little weird at first. You call em persist and pass it the object you want to save. And then you call em flush. And the flush is actually when the operation happens. The reason it's split is so that you could persist 10 things and then run one flush. So we're kind of used to, not, you're, a lot of people are used to just seeing like save um, so it's two steps, but it's uh, the same thing behind the scenes. And then I'm just going to return the JSON. So same thing, return this error JSON, and I'm going to give it a title field and an ID field, and it's just going to work. Um, yep, so I can send a curl request to that, and it gets back our, our new song. Um, so that was cool. So we used that new tool, the entity manager. We saved things to the database. Uh, creating the JSON was a little bit too much work. It may not have seemed it, but... I actually did the title and ID field. I basically made the JSON uh, manual. I was like, I right, here I have this really nice class. It has an ID property, a title property. I created that property, but then when I turned it to JSON, I did it by hand. I like manually created the array. So it definitely begs the question. You're like, could we just do that? Return this arrow JSON and just pass it the object, and then that turns it into JSON. Who knows? Because they've made the mistake like I have many times. Who knows what happens when you JSON underscore encode, like the PHP function, JSON encode an object? The answer, like anything, is it depends. Probably, well, in the case of, in this case, we'd get an empty, an empty JSON string, an empty JSON, you know, curly, open curly, close curly. It, uh, it actually does what you think it would do, because you think maybe it just JSON encodes all the properties. It does as long as they're public. So since we made these private, or you could use protected, we get nothing back. And in fact, it doesn't work. Boo. Unless you install Symfony's serializer. So again, it's like on that same thing of like, if you need another tool, just install it. So behind the scenes, this arrow JSON, that function does is it, uh, it checks to see if the serializer library is available. And if it is, it uses that. 
And if it's not, it falls back to just a normal JSON underscore and code, like super simple type of a thing. So Compose requires Serializer, and suddenly like that, that actually does work. So it's just, a, it's just a, a service. It gives us a service, gives us an object that's really good at turning things into, uh, into JSON or XML or whatever you want. Um, making a, so this is another endpoint, making a git endpoint um, is actually one line. There, uh, this is a bit of a show off slide. There's like a lot kind of going on here. Uh, you guys see that the, the route has slash API slash long slash curly brace ID. Uh, you guys know from doing Drupal controllers that that normally means that we would have a dollar sign ID argument to our controller. You know, whatever you have in your curly brace, you can have as an argument to your controller. That's true here. Symphony also has an extra layer of magic, and Drupal has this in a few places as well, where if you want, you can just type hint the entity name, and it'll see the ID there, and it'll just query for that by the ID, because it'll see the ID is the name of a property on your country song, and it just does the database query for you. And if it's not there, it throws a 404. And then we can just return this error JSON, that object. Yes, there are ways to do custom queries, um, but a lot of times you don't need to because it's just as simple as that. Um, so what, like, that's nice. Uh, we can also generate a CRUD. Um, this is just showing off some of the other features. So one of, the, like, one of the things that I love about the way that Symphony 4 does things is, like, again, we start really small. That's really great, and it, the, the project builds with you. But as you've probably noticed, there's a lot of installing things. Uh, and most of the time, the way you're going to figure this out is you're going to say, I need a logger or I need a cache, and you're going to Google for that. And the docs are going to tell you right at the top, great, run compose require logger. That's how you're going to know. You're not going to be, you're not going to have to, you're not going to be lost in the desert trying to figure out what to install. But anywhere we can, we try to give really clear error messages. So if you try to use something that's not available, we try to give you the exact composer command you need to do to do that. So in this case, I'm using the make crud. So I want to just quickly get a crud for my, my uh, country song. Um, but we're missing Symphony's form system and a couple other pieces, so it just spits out the composer require line for that. So it's like, cool, it's all good. Just run these commands, and you'll have what you need. So then we actually can run make crud. This only asks us one question, which is basically, what entity do you want to have a crud for? Uh, so we enter country song, and it generates us like those uh, eight files or so. And it looks like this. It's ugly, I know. But that's Symphony. We, we don't give, there's no theming layer out of the box. We haven't added any styles to our page, so this is just basically using no styles right now. But you have a fully functional uh, CRUD area there that you can mess around with. Um, security, uh, actually I mentioned this in part because this is also relevant to uh, Drupal. It's just kind of a cool thing. There's a library called uh, the Security Checker. Um, I have the alias up there, but you can look it up. It's like Sensio Lab slash security dash checker, I think. You can install this into your project. And then when you do that, um, well, I think in Drupal you have to do one other thing. But uh, you actually have a bin console command you can run in Symfony, security colon check, and it checks your compose.json against known CVE vulnerabilities on the versions of your dependencies and checks to see if like, you have any dependencies that have known security vulnerabilities. Um, so, you know. Security is not always the sexiest, but it's, this is a good thing to have. Uh, Flex also gives you a warning in general if it installs something and it, it sees that there's a security problem with that. Um, also, and, um, and no, I'm not making any money off this, which is why I get to talk about it. Uh, Symphony, this is, uh, just launched a new service. This is like security.symphony.com where you can actually upload your composer.json file and it will tell you if you have any security vulnerabilities. It's, again, that actually applies uh, to Drupal projects. And, um, and the, the service here, um, which costs like two euro a month, uh, is something where it will basically check that every single day. And as soon as it suddenly sees that a CVE has come out on one of your uh, project's um, uh, libraries that you use, it'll message you. Like, hey, last night a security vulnerability came out for this library you need to upgrade. Um, other bonus, oh man, if, and, and if, I, if, I, if I skipped everything else, if I, was, if I was trying to sell you guys on Symfony, I could have skipped everything else and, and just come to this. API platform, this is an, a library, uh, API building library that's built on top of Symfony. And you already saw, it's very easy to create API endpoints. You create a route controller, this error JSON, you're good to go, okay? But obviously we know that in, in bigger app APIs, like things get more complicated really quickly. So uh, if you want a larger, more robust API, you can just run composer require API. That's going to install stuff. It's going to do some recipes, et cetera, et cetera. But you're just installing the library. Then step two is to go into your entity. That's our country song entity. 
and to add one new annotation on the top, at API resource. Then you have this huge API and documentation built automatically for you. So this is actually what happens when you go to localhost colon 8000 slash API. This is a swagger-like uh, API documentation, if you've seen that before. It's behind the scenes. It, we actually now have a git post, uh, git, uh, git collection post, uh, git single, delete, and put endpoints set up for that country song entity. You can open any of those and actually like start playing with them. So this is me expanding the documentation. I can try out the endpoints and it'll actually tell me what it, uh, you're getting back. Gives you the curl command if you want to run at the command line. Um, the post endpoint, again, you can play with that. You can give it uh, data. You can actually submit and see what would happen. Um, or you can actually go directly to the URL and, and see what it would actually look like. Um, what did I want to say about that? Oh, yeah. Um, and it's a super legit API. It uses JSON, LD, and Hydra. If you're into like the super REST nerdy stuff, it's like a super, super robust API. And yes, I know everything that is enabled with just one line uh, means that you're like, you're thinking like, what, how much of a pain in the ass is it to configure? Um, yes, you can configure the heck out of things. It's not a pain in the ass. Um, so that's really, really, really big sell for this thing, and I did have not actually worked on it, so I can't take any credit for it. It's just a really, really great thing that just works with Symfony. One command and you have it. By the way, if you wanted to try it out in your Symfony project, you run Composer Require API, you mess around with it for an hour, and if you didn't like it, you run Composer Remove API, it uninstalls the package and removes the recipe. So any configuration files it created, it just takes those out. So you can um, try things out really quickly without having like a big cost. Admin generator, I threw this one in because it's also a freebie. Composer require admin. Uh, then you go to one configuration file and you say that I want an admin section for my country song entity. And then you can go to localhost colon 8000 slash admin and you have an admin section for that. Okay. Oh, and bonus, uh, and this one is uh, more of a shameless plug. Um, how many people have worked with Webpack? Okay, great. How many people enjoyed working with Webpack? Yeah, probably, maybe probably the after effect, but probably not the setup. So if, uh, not in Drupal, because Drupal mostly has its own system for handling assets and things like that, but one of the libraries that we package with Symfony, but is actually 100% independent of Symfony and 100% independent of PHP, uh, is a library called Webpack Encore, and it basically makes using Webpack really, really easy. So if you, uh, Webpack is something that basically like combines your CSS and JS files and lets you like require JavaScript files from other things and process SAS and do all kinds of crazy things. Um, with Webpack Encore, you can do that in a configuration file that's really easy to read, and it's like 12 lines long. And you just set that up, and you're off to the races. Uh, behind the scenes, it generates a Webpack configuration file, which is probably 300 lines long. And that's what normally you have to do on your own if you use Webpack. Um, I believe me, because I, I did that, and it was awful. And so I was like, we should create something to make that simpler. So if you're interested in that, just kind of write that name down. Um, so <laughs> Drupal and Symfony, great awkward friends. Uh, it's like not everything translates exactly. Drupal has its weird things. Symphony has its weird things. But there's so much of a core. I'm not going to tell you that there's not going to be a learning curve in Symphony, but like, it, there's so much overlap. There's so much that you're not going to have to learn that you would have to learn uh, if you use anything else. So it's like a super super cool thing. I mean, it's the reason that I know how Drupal works. I have no business knowing how Drupal works, but they put so much Symphony into it that I'm like, yeah, I get it. This is cool. So they both have routing controllers. They both have the container. Difference, of course, is many services versus like few services in Symfony. Um, the plugins are modules versus bundles. Uh, console tool, Drupal console. We have bin console. So same exact concepts. And of course, we all have, we all use OOP, namespaces, composer. We use them in the exact same way. Um, you know, and Symfony starts really tiny and just kind of like grows with you. You know, they, we really wanted it to be, feels much like a micro framework when you download it in the beginning. Like, here's your tiny project that's super easy to understand. Uh, and we didn't give you 100 files, we gave you like 10 files. And it does just this one thing. So it's easy uh, to understand, easy to maintain. Um, by the way, side note, Symfony does a really good job with this backwards compatibility stuff. So uh, if you use a Symphony project, it's really easy to upgrade. So uh, you know, I know that in the Drupal world, you guys are all well aware of the pains of upgrading. So it's another thing. If you use something with Symphony, you're not going to ever get stuck or screwed over or have some horrible upgrade path. It's going to be the opposite. So it starts small, and then you just install stuff. And again, Symphony.sh is basically the key place you can go to to see like all like the the libraries that we recommend that you install. 
So if you guys have a project that doesn't need a CMS, it's kind of a home run. So definitely try Symfony. And at the very least, it's going to make your Drupal foo way more awesome too. Because you're going to see basically all those Drupal things that you've been using kind of in a different context and, uh, and get way better at it. Um, at the bottom here, last thing I'll say is uh, there's, if you go to github.com slash Weaver Ryan, and I know that I made the repository name as long as I could. Uh, but you can actually see the finished code for what we built today. So you can actually go in and dig in and try it out if you want to. And that is it. Thank you, guys. <laughs>And, oh, nice animation. My wife put that in there. If you guys do want to learn more about Symphony, we have a free tutorial on campuniversity.com. Uh, so go, to, to go, to, go there, and we have a Symphony track. And the first tutorial, it's like an hour plus long. It's, it's totally free, and it goes through a lot of the stuff. Um, should be fairly easy for you guys, since you guys have been doing the exact same stuff inside of Drupal. Uh, questions? Yep. Hello. Thanks for the reports. And, uh, are there some tools for local development in Symfony world? Uh, I heard about uh, Larvair Homestead. Uh, is it good enough? And uh, are there any other tools, maybe? Yeah, for, uh, so are there any tools kind of specifically for like development setups? Yeah. Kind of things, yeah. So um, are, there, are, there, are there tools for development kind of setups in Symfony? And you mentioned Laravel Homestead, which is uh, uh, something that helps you basically set up like a VM really easily. Um, we actually recommend using Laravel Homestead. Uh, it's a nice, it's a really nice tool. It's made by Laravel, which is a different framework, but they just made a nice tool that it makes it really easy to boot up virtual machines. And they have like a Symphony flavor or something in it, um, and it works really well. Thank you. Yep. Is the uh, idea of like a small Symphony, like Silex, is that idea still alive, or is it part of Symphony now? Ah, uh, so what's the deal with Symphony? Symphony is small, and there's Silex, which is the micro framework. So we killed Silex. So Silex has actually been deprecated, and unless the community jumps in, won't have like further development. Um, so Silex is a true micro framework. Everything's inside of like one file. And yeah, the goal was basically to make Symphony as small as possible so that you didn't have to choose between the two. Because the problem was like before, you're like, oh, I have, I have this really small thing. It's a little API. Let's build it in Silex, which is a micro framework built on the Symphony components. And then suddenly it becomes like the flagship product of your company. And you're like, crap, I wish we, because Silex is a lot more work to wire everything together. Every time you install something new, there's a lot of configuration. Um, so that, that sucked. And there was really, there's no easy upgrade path from Silex to Symfony. So to have our cake and eat it too, we just made Symfony really, really tiny. So you can use it for that little internal API project. And when it becomes the flagship of your company, it's still Symfony and it just grows and scales with you. Good question. So Dries was talking about uh, making installing Drupal easier. Is there any discussion about using Flex and recipes and that sort of paradigm? Mm, yeah, is there any, question, is there any uh, uh, discussion about using Flex with dr installing Drupal modules and things like that? Not now. S somebody could start that conversation. Flex is definitely very focused on Symfony framework right now, and it's important uh, like from the Symphony team, like it's important for us. That, that's very important for us. We're not trying to create a tool that does everything for everybody. However, Drupal is a little bit of a special case. Um, and to be clear, there's really nothing like in the Flex, if you looked at the Flex uh, library itself, there's not much in there that really ties it to the Symphony framework. There are a couple little things that we did that are you know, cute things that are specific to the Symphony framework. What really makes Flex a Symphony framework only tool is that there's a repository where all the recipes are stored. So the recipes aren't stored like in your, with, with the libraries themselves. They're actually stored in a central repository. And there's a couple reasons for that. One of them is so we can kind of make sure they're high quality. Another one is sometimes you want a recipe for something that um, uh, maybe is not a Symfony thing. It's just a random library or even an NPM package. We actually have a way for you to install Webpack Encore with a recipe that through a PHP package. So the point is they're in a central repository. And since Flex is basically hard-coded to look at that repository and that repository only, well, that repository is full of recipes that assume you're using the Symfony framework. So yeah, it's not like uh, anything would need to be completely reinvented or rebuilt to make something else that looked like a different recipe server. So maybe it would be, it would be interesting. All right, I think I'm out of time anyways. So uh, if you guys have any other questions, um, you know, if you're like, you want to tell me I was wrong about something, that's cool too. Come up and say hi. Oh yeah, my slides will be available. I'll, I'll attach them to my node. 
uh, shortly. Good question. this thing bumbling in my brain for a while that we asked the system for something everything you were just doing you know I need a table with this many these columns mm -hmm. so the idea is that the system will ask us and like what are you building today and it just well Almost like natural language, ah. like voice controlled. And that seems like it's like one or two steps away from that. Yeah, that's actually a really interesting perspective to have. So we normally think of, like, I, I work on that uh, that maker library that gives you those code generation commands. Yeah. And we typically think of like, what's a what's a thing people build? Let's make a generator for that. Um, but yeah, yours is like one step away from that, where you're like, let's ask them, let's ask that same question, but in a different way. And maybe what we ultimately do is generate them X, but we didn't ask them, hey, do you want to generate X? Right. Yeah. That's really and interesting. And even, even something that's more abstracted, so like, what are you building today? It's going to be a music database. And then it would kind of already know what the ontologies are for, you know, like, I noticed that it was... You put in your variable and it just guessed what the type was. Oh, you saw that with the created ads? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, saw that like ad that. at the end. Anyway. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Hi. Hi. Thank you for doing that. I love that. Awesome. Oh, yeah, of course, yeah. Super fun. It's like it's so fun for me to like be able to teach something that has taken such a big step forward in the health experience. You know. Thank you. Yeah, it's so nice to like actually see you in person. Yeah. And thanks for thanks for uh, fixing my blog post. Oh yeah, no problem. So funny. I was like. Correct. I phrased that horribly. No. Yes. Thank you for No, it was great. It was, it, was a, it was a cool idea. And actually, it was in my workshop yesterday. It's one of the questions I got. And it was like, what about Symphony 4? I was like, oh, I wrote a blog post about that on Drupalize. Mm -hmm. 